Welcome to The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this behind-the-scenes look at PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. Here we talk to the key players at PETA and the movement and ask them about how animal rights change their lives and how they stay motivated to make the world a better place for the animals. On this episode, Undercover for the Animals, what PETA found at PetSmart stores in Nashville and around the nation, a corporate system that devalued the animals and incentivized animal abuse. There were conversations uh, on several nights, you know, about, uh, look, you know, we ran out of hamster food. Um, don't order any more hamster food for the next few days. You know, don't give the hamsters food tonight, you know, um, bedding. Uh, stop changing the bedding so frequently. We're running low on bedding. We can't afford to order more because I want my bonus. Now, the interesting thing about the bedding, of course, is that in these filthy conditions, that's where disease breeds. You know, so you have guinea pigs, for instance, who had ringworm that was prevalent at all the stores. That's a zoonotic disease. That's transmissible to human beings. So you have this this filth, these these disgusting tanks. Um, which is promoting the spread of ringworm, for instance, among guinea pigs. Well, who's going to get these guinea pigs most often, right? It's kids. Dan Payton, Director of Evidence Analysis for PETA Investigations, outlining what was uncovered at PetSmart and why law enforcement in Nashville thought enough of the hazards to the animals and public health to execute a search warrant and free endangered animals. This is historic. I mean, this is absolutely historic. This was a huge day um, for small animals. Uh, this was a huge day for animals in the pet trade. You know, we have seen systemic neglect before in the suppliers to the, to the chains. I, I don't think we've ever documented so clearly um, an absolute culture of indifference to pain and to suffering as we did here um, in these stores and in particular in Nashville. PetSmart is uh, incentivizing the neglect, the systemic, sometimes fatal neglect of the animals they are trying to sell to the public. More of my interview with Dan Payton. But first, I want to thank you for joining us as we embark on getting the word out 24-7 via podcast on the internet. Send a link to your friends and let people know worldwide that the animals have a voice on the PETA podcast. Begin with our conversation with PETA president and co-founder Ingrid Newkirk in episode one. If you missed it, check out the links on this podcast player or on PETA.org or wherever you listen to podcasts. Stitcher, YouTube, Spotify, you'll find us. We're also in the midst of horse racing season uh, with the prep races to the Kentucky Derby and the Triple Crown. And you can listen to how PETA is working to end animal abuse in that so-called sport. You can check out all our previous episodes on iTunes. And now more of my conversation with Dan Payton, Director of Evidence Analysis for PETA Investigations. After a lengthy investigation in three PetSmart stores around the nation, the evidence procured was enough for Nashville law enforcement to get a warrant. And when they walked into the store in Nashville, what they found was a sickening example of a corporate culture that devalued little creatures and saw them simply as loss leaders for pet supply profits. At PetSmart in Nashville, here's what they found. They found six uh, animals who were severely ill, uh, some, some hamsters, some guinea pigs, some mice, uh, in the back of a PetSmart store in Nashville who uh, were in dire need of veterinary care and had been denied that care. Uh, they removed those animals, and thankfully they are now in the care of a veterinarian and have a clean, comfortable place to get some rest and uh, hopefully are on the mend. And what is the, the legal status? Uh, did anyone get arrested? Is there going to be a, any charges brought against PetSmart or the store? The Nashville District Attorney's Office uh, did confirm uh, uh, last Friday that they are considering filing cruelty to animals charges um, that may be against individuals. Um, it, they may follow the chain. They may go where the evidence and the questions lead them, and they may take on the corporation itself. We will see. 
Um, but the animals were seized by warrant and documents were seized as well. And so the criminal investigation continues and one hopes soon that there's some cruelty charges filed. Now we're talking about hamsters, we're talking about guinea pigs, small animals. And while it, it all sounds bad, I can see why some people might say, well, why is this that important? I mean, these are small animals. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you must have heard that when you were in Nashville. Oh, repeatedly. Uh, I was asked that over and over again. You know, they're not dogs. They're not cats. Why all the, you know, why all the fracas? Why are there cop cars here? Why is there crime scene tape up, et cetera? Um, you know, a few things to keep in mind. These are animals who, even if they don't look like the, the species we're more familiar with in America, they don't look like dogs. They don't look like cats. They're just as capable of feeling pain and suffering as are those animals, uh, regardless of what they look like. Um, when they're denied veterinary care for fluid on their lungs or for infection that has spread from a wound throughout their bloodstream, you know, and coursing into their brain, coursing into their heart, um, they feel just the way dogs and cats feel. Um, and thankfully, Tennessee law defines animal in a common sense way to include not just dogs, not just cats, um, but birds, but reptiles, but hamsters, guinea pigs, and mice. Yeah, and yet, you would not, or PETA would not have found out about this had you not had a, a person inside documenting all this. And what did the investigator, uh, who was an employee there, what did he or she find? No, you're right. I mean, these sick animals, these are animals who, who, who were found on the store floor, who had been for sale, who were isolated because they were obviously sick and injured. They're shuffled off to a back room, out of public view. They're kept in bins uh, behind a door that says employees only. And what our investigator documented over and over and again was that the management uh, of this store refused, declined. Um, there are, there's, there's not too many ways to say it. Turn their backs on these animals, refuse to provide them veterinary care, um, precisely so that they could cut costs and so that they themselves could take home bonuses at the end of a financial quarter for PetSmart, which is one of America's uh, 50 largest privately held companies. So are you saying that this was a kind of corporate policy that the the managers were handed down from from on high and then they they told their employees to to not take care of sick animals or that dying animals or not take yeah. them to the vet yeah exactly right so this is a seven billion dollar annual revenue company that has an agreement with veterinary clinics across the country uh to get free exams for sick and injured animals. And yet that was not done here because at the end of a quarter, particularly towards the end of January in this case, the animal care costs at this store were nearing a point past which the three top managers at the store would not be eligible to take home more pay uh, some Friday night. So PetSmart, if, if we understand this correctly, if these managers are telling the truth, PetSmart is uh, incentivizing the neglect, the systemic, sometimes fatal neglect of the animals they are trying to sell to the public. So it just wasn't in a manager's self-interest to do the right thing and call a vet or to treat a sick or injured animal or to uh, be concerned about the animal. It, was, it would have been the right thing to do, the decent thing to do, the lawful thing to do, we would argue. But it wasn't in their financial interest. And, you know, from, from all appearances, these people are not working at the store because they, they have compassion for animals. They care about animals. They're working there to get a paycheck. And their paycheck was bigger because they refused to help these animals until Peter's investigator stepped in and adopted the animals and removed them and took them to the emergency vet. Um, PETA paid for these animals to get the care that PetSmart ought to have provided them in the first place. And um, it's those veterinary statements that detail the very critically needed care these animals had been denied. It's those documents that um, got law enforcement in the door last Thursday in Nashville. And uh, we hope we'll get these people 
charged with cruelty to animals. So the investigator took out a number of, of animals, and then law enforcement went in and got six more animals? That's right. So the, the eyewitness for PETA uh, adopted numerous animals over the course of the investigation, um, had them all vetted. Um, these animals have been adopted out. Uh, we have a few more who will be available for adoption soon once they get uh, a little bit more care. Um, and then, yes, the police and animal control took six animals out last Thursday. Um, those animals were critically ill, far more uh, sick and injured uh, than I think anyone had expected. Um, and those animals are getting care. So the hope is that for each particular uh, animal, for each individual um, who has been clearly denied needed veterinary care, that cruelty charges would be filed for each of those animals. And is that a misdemeanor or a felony? What, what sort of charges can be brought against either the individuals or the corporation? So in Tennessee, we're looking at a misdemeanor, a class A misdemeanor charge, which is punishable, each of them punishable by up to 364 days behind bars and or a $2,500 fine. Um, Tennessee, like most states, defines person in its criminal statutes in a way that would include a corporation or a legal entity. So it's possible, it would be tough, but it's possible that the corporation itself could be charged. I think clearly, you know, the, the liability uh, and the responsibility begins with the individual managers who are on video saying that they were not going to provide care to these animals. Now, if law enforcement follows the evidence and questions those people, and those people say, you know, look, I'm acting under a directive from my boss, and they keep following that lead going up, hopefully it ends up with someone at PetSmart's corporate headquarters. And, you know, the company could be held legally accountable uh, for the conduct that it appears to have put its managers um, in a position and with very few other choices to to follow out. So this is something that people would find at every PetSmart? This is a, a national policy at all the stores? It appears that way. And what I can tell you is, is you know, PetSmart has 1,600 stores. They are the largest, you know, so-called pet retailer in the country. Um, and what we found in Nashville is not by any means limited to that store. The same eyewitness worked in a store in Peoria, Arizona, which is maybe 20 minutes from PetSmart's headquarters in Phoenix, and then worked in a store um, clear across the country, uh, just outside Tampa, Florida. And the same culture of indifference to animal suffering, the same neglect, the same pervasive suffering and uh, refusal to so much as get veterinary exams for animals was on display. Um, in both those stores. And there is every reason to believe, based on what else PETA has documented over the years in this industry, that the pervasive animal suffering and turning a blind eye to it among those in authority um, is essentially an SOP uh, across PetSmart's chain. It's certainly the SOP across Petco's chain. And it is part and parcel of the pet trade period in the United States. This is a, a kind of a, a corporate policy that what the bottom line is profit. And 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 if you sell live animals, they're kind of the the loss leader, if you will. They're not the ones that are driving the bottom line. You know, they want right. to sell these other things and but and so they, they consider the the animal, the live animal really insignificant. Yeah, I mean, you know, we at PETA we speak of animals as as who and as individuals and as subjects, and you know, there you're talking about a, a view that sees these animals as object, as things, um, to put on the shelf. Um, I think live animal sales constitute something on the order of three percent of this chain's annual revenue, so three percent of seven billion dollars. Um, the vast majority of the of the rest of that money is made off of so-called hard goods. So, the the small animals are there: the birds, the reptiles, the the little mammals, hamsters, guinea pigs, gerbils, mice, rats. They're there not 
themselves to make pet smart money. In some cases, I think they probably lose the company money. They're there as the so-called gateway purchase. They're there to draw people who care about animals in so that they spend five bucks on the animal, but then spend $200, $300 on a tank and bedding and food and water receptacles and toys. And it's those hard goods which are marked up 200, 300%. And that's where PetSmart's making its billions off of good people. But the animals are paying the price and, and often with their lives for uh, that approach and the indifference that, you know, that its employees have towards very real animal suffering. Now, what did Pet, PetSmart say uh, in response to the, the media coverage of, the, of law enforcement going into the store in Nashville, pulling out the animals? What, what yes. did they say on the record? And what did the, the managers there say? Did they, they admit that it was a policy? Uh, interestingly enough, you know, there was, a, there was a hamster who was removed from the store who had a, a very enlarged eye. Um, and come to find out, according to the veterinarian who examined that animal, um, that eye protrusion is the result of a severe infection inside the animal's mouth. And the manager had repeatedly said, well, the eye will resolve on its own. The eye will resolve on its own. You know, basically not to worry. He was right, because according to the vet, <laughs> the way that that eye would have resolved was it would have burst. It would have ruptured. And apparently he repeated that claim to law enforcement. Hey, well, you know, the problem would have worked itself out. Well, yeah, if you consider working itself out, you know, basically bursting and leaving the animal bleeding out of the eye socket. PetSmart as an entity, as a corporation, has essentially said they're looking into it for whatever that's worth. And they actually just, um, they tried kind of a red herring move. And they seized on um, a few scenes in the video we released from past investigations of their supplier mills and their warehouses, which uh, we very clearly identified as having been recorded in the past. And they seized on that and said, well, you know, we're not sure about the video. It seems they think that they're above a court of law, which had looked at all this video um, and had determined that it was probable cause and, you know, given law enforcement the search and seizure warrant that they executed last Thursday. The investigation could continue and maybe uh, we might see fines, we might see some kind of corporate change. But in the meantime, what can can consumers do? Uh, live animal sales are continuing at these places. Uh, what do people who are good people who shop at these big big box stores like PetSmart, what, what should they, they do in, in light of all this? Yeah, it really, it's, it's really on us. It's on good people to, to end this cruelty. Um, and the way to do that is to stop shopping at these places until they end live animal sales. Um, you know, many of us have beloved animal companions, whether those are dogs and cats or they're small animals or reptiles or fish um, or birds. And the answer is not to go into PetSmart, not to go into Petco. Um, to buy supplies for those animals, um, but instead to patronize retailers, whether that's other big box stores, small stores, or online retailers that are not selling animals. Because until that's done, as long as PetSmart continues to make bucks off of people um, buying hard goods and buying supplies, they're going to go on selling those live animals as a way to keep getting people through the door. And the, the message that they need to hear is that people will not shop there until all those animals are gone. Is that effective? Do you think that can, can make some kind of impact? I and mean, we're not calling for a boycott or anything like that, but right. people can see what the policy is there and they might take it upon themselves to, to take some kind of action. Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, I, you know, if I'm in PetSmart shoes and I hear my customer base, my clientele saying to me that 95% of my sales are at risk because of a policy I have uh, that dictates I sell individual creatures, you know, for 3% of my sales. Why the heck would I not listen to those people? I mean, if I'm PetSmart and I'm in the business to make billions of dollars, 
And there's nothing wrong with that. That's fine. But you do it, you know, without making animals pay the price um, with pain, with suffering, with disease, in filthy enclosures. You, you, you do that without making those animals pay the price um, and without incurring the wrath of, of caring people who, even if the victims aren't dogs and cats, are still understandably just as passionate and just as concerned uh, by what this video shows. Now, if there's anything we can say about PetSmart is that they, they do allow for the adoption of dogs and cats. They don't sell dogs and cats. How does that compare with the live animal trade with these small animals that, that they use as these, these profit leaders? Yeah, it, well, it's a good point. You know, uh, to their credit, right, they, they see that there's an overpopulation crisis out there for dogs and cats, and they invite various adoption groups and, and rescue groups in um, to use their space to try to find animals' homes. That's a, that's a good thing. Um, it's basically PR cover for the fact that they are, for lack of a better term, pimping out very, very small animals for whom there is an equally profound overpopulation crisis. There is no shortage of guinea pigs and hamsters and other rodents and birds and reptiles out there across America who are dying in shelters and in rescues because just like dogs and cats, there simply aren't enough good homes for them. And yet PetSmart continues to subsidize the breeding of these animals in massive warehouses and mills across the U.S. And it continues to subsidize their, you know, hell-like transfer and, and transport across the country. And it continues to put them on their shelves uh, for sale. Now, you mentioned a video that people can see on PETA.org. Yes, that's right. Yes. And describe the video. Uh, the video will, will take people very quickly through um, the reality for small animals in PetSmart, both in Nashville and also in Peoria, Arizona, um, also in Brandon, Florida, and also in their supply chain. It shows Towns, a guinea pig who one Friday night was found by the eyewitness. He could not stand up. It shows a manager saying, we're not going to take a $15 animal to an emergency veterinarian where you know care or euthanasia is going to cost us two, $300. It shows, for instance, um, Tony, a, a mouse, who was dying very slowly over the course of essentially a month of respiratory ailment. Um, and again, it shows management refusing to help that animal. Um, and the animal was found dead in a tank one morning. It shows a bird. Uh, named Valencia in the Florida store, who again was deathly ill, uh, had urine and feces covering his vent, um, which is essentially the, the opening of the digestive tract in, in birds. Um, shows the manager saying, look, you know, maybe we'll get the animal in for care uh, in a few days. And our eyewitness says, I don't think the bird's going to make it. And the answer is, well, I wish I had a better answer for you, but I don't. And sure enough, the next morning, you know, the bird was found dead in the cage. It just, it opens the doors to the back rooms in these stores where public, you know, wouldn't otherwise know what's going on back there. And I think it shows things that a good person who cares about animals wouldn't be caught dead supporting. And unfortunately, you are supporting this even if you just go in and buy cat litter. You are giving this company billions of dollars and they will not stop all this cruelty until you withdraw your support from even purchases like that. And of course, it's all about dollars because in the back of the minds of these managers, you know, when they say on tape that, you know, this is a, a, a small animal, there's, you know, it only costs X and it's not worth it to bring to a vet, you know, they're thinking nothing but self-interest because they know that they've got this budget that they, they want to go under yeah. because if they go over the budget, there goes their bonuses. There goes uh, yeah. the extra money that would go into their pockets directly, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, this is, this is just a job for these people. I mean, you know, there, there's no indication that they're in this because they actually care for animals or want to help animals. In fact, I think if, if you care for animals, one of the last places on earth you'd be caught dead. 
would be a PetSmart store at this point. Um, they are doing this solely for the bottom line. PetSmart's doing everything solely for the bottom line. Um, and that's the case whether we're talking about a factory farm uh, or a, a mink factory farm, uh, a slaughterhouse, or the pet trade. You know, when, when animals are seen as commodities, as stock uh, to make money off of, um, or solely to get people in the door, you know, to make purchases around um, their welfare, their basic needs, you know, even so much as a proper diet or a proper bedding or enrichment, uh, let alone, you know, desperately needed veterinary care. Those things fall by the wayside because they cost money. They take time. They take effort. And that's not an investment these managers or the company were willing to make in animals they think are either going to die or, you know, go out the front doors with a customer in a few days. Yeah. Well, it's also, if you, if you think they're going to die, it's sort of good money after bad. You say, well, you know, it's, it's cut our losses. These are inexpensive animals. But you would think that a huge company, a Fortune 100 corporation, you would think they could afford to feed the animals. Because I understand it, it, it also extends not just to the the welfare in terms of their health, but also in terms of feeding. I mean, if they if the feed budget, if they went over budget on the feed, they just didn't feed the animals, right? Yeah, it was it was it was just basic stuff, bare bones things. I mean, there were conversations uh, on several nights, you know, about uh, look, you know, we ran out of hamster food. Um, don't order any more hamster food for the next few days. You know, don't give the hamsters food tonight. You know, um, bedding. Uh, stop changing the bedding so frequently. We're running low on bedding. We can't afford um, to order more because I want my bonus. Now, the interesting thing about the bedding, of course, is that in these filthy conditions, that's where disease breeds. You know, so you have guinea pigs, for instance. Who had ringworm that was prevalent at all the stores well that's a zoonotic disease that's transmissible to human beings so you have this this filth these these disgusting tanks um which is promoting the spread of ringworm for instance among guinea pigs well who's going to get these guinea pigs most often right it's kids um who are not known to be great about say washing their hands after they handle these animals so these animals go out the door, um, and who knows? You know, going out with them are diseases like a uh, ringworm, like coccidiosis um, in reptiles, for instance, which we also documented. So, you know, people are obviously concerned about animals' health. They're surely concerned about their own health. And, um, I mean, this was, you know, a potential public health hazard and risk just as much as it looks to us to be a, a probably a criminal cruelty to animals case. Yeah, and all this just from a policy of cutting corners when it comes to animal welfare and, and keeping the cost low. All this just so that, you know, that $7 billion wasn't, say, $6.95 billion, you know, yeah. in, in the most recent fiscal year. Yeah, this is giving people a financial motivation to deny animals what they deserve by law and what they need, the, the bare minimums of what they need, not even to, to live, but to just stay alive. I mean, it's, it's not even a life in these stores, but I mean, they're just denying these animals everything that they really need. Now, is this stance in terms of uh, budget and priority is this indicative of how other companies that deal in live animal sales, is this indicative of that kind of cor corporate thinking or corporate culture when it comes to live animal sales? It really is. You know, we, we have, PETA has been, you know, looking at and revealing the reality of the pet trade industry for, for decades. Um, and I've been working on this for 11 years and we've exposed seven uh, wholesale animal mills, factory farms, really, for small animals, for birds, for reptiles, that have ties to PetSmart, Petco, and, and across the, the pet trade industry. 
and it's the same. I, I, I mean, the the suffering, the neglect, the cruelty, the filth, the disease. It's essentially an SOP in this trade. It's everywhere we've gone. Uh, good people call us from other stores where we've not been and from other suppliers we've not been and say the exact same thing, that it's basically the same. And it just goes to the fact that the people who are running these places are in it for the dollar sign. They're not in it for animals. They're not in it for consumers. Uh, they're in it um, to make money, plain and simple. And they cut corners um, in every way possible. And the animals' <laughs> needs are typically the first thing that gets cut. Yeah. Now, Dan, we're going to follow this story in Nashville. And, of course, the hope is that what happens in Nashville will will follow PetSmart or, or all over the country. But people yeah. listening to this, when they know uh, there's a PetSmart uh, down at the mall or, you know, if they're thinking about patronizing a place like this, what what, what kind of action, again, can, should people take? In, in light of all this that, that Pete has exposed in the investigation? Steer clear of PetSmart. I mean, the only reason you should go into PetSmart, honestly, is to tell them that you're not shopping there anymore until they send until they end live animal sales. Um, you can go to Walgreens. You can go to Target. You can go to many Walmarts that don't sell animals um, and buy your supplies for those animals uh, there. That way you are taking care of your companions, you're giving them the food, the litter, the toys, the bedding, whatever it is that you want. Um, but you're not, at the same time, subsidizing uh, a greedy <laughs> corporation that is still uh, trading in live animals. Now, Dan, you've been at this for 11 years or so, mm -hmm. and in the investigations area at PETA, and from what you've seen, where does this stack up? How does this compare with the other things you have seen? How bad is this? Oh, this, this is historic. I mean, this is absolutely historic. This was a huge day um, for small animals. Uh, this was a huge day for animals in the pet trade. Um, you know, we have seen systemic neglect before in the suppliers. To the, to the chains. I, I don't think we've ever documented so clearly um, an absolute culture of indifference to pain and to suffering as we did here um, in these stores and in particular in Nashville. Um, it was a massive day. You know, we have had 26,000 animals seized in one case before, that was at U.S. Global Exotics um, in Arlington, Texas in 2009. Um, interestingly, that place had ties to PetSmart, um, so they're no stranger for this. But, you know, I would say that even for the six animals who got pulled uh, from PetSmart last Thursday in Nashville, you know, to them, that day meant as much to them as... December 2009 uh, meant to the 26,000 animals seized from U.S. Global. Um, you know, for the individual creatures um, who have their own personalities, um, and I've had the pleasure of interacting with a bunch of the small animals we've been able to remove from the PetSmart stores in, in this investigation. They are wonderful creatures. They are unique. Uh, they each have a very distinct personality, just like a dog, just like a cat. And we really could not be happier for those six to get out and to have a new lease on life, um, hopefully to recover with a lot of care and to get a chance to be in a loving home that, you know, had they stayed in that back room in Nashville, they, they probably would have never been able to find. Is there one in particular that you uh, have bonded with uh, in this investigation? I know that you mentioned, yeah. you mentioned Tony. Who passed Tony on? The yeah, Tony, Tony the, the didn't make it out. Yeah, yeah, we've we've had some really fantastic uh, guinea pigs and hamsters, for instance. Um, Hank uh, was a hamster uh, from one of the stores. Um, he was a, a Russian hamster. Uh, he might have weighed three ounces, but boy, he's got the personality of a of a thirty pound uh, beagle. I mean, he is just he's the mm. boss. He really is. Um, I met Rupert. 
Uh, Rupert is a hamster, a dwarf hamster, uh, who had the protruding eye uh, that I spoke of earlier. I got to meet him. Um, he might be one ounce. And um, that creature, you know, you look into his eyes and, and you just know that there is a very intelligent, complicated little soul behind those eyes um, who deserves so much more than PetSmart would have ever given him. And it is, it is so fulfilling at the end of these cases to meet these individuals and to see them leave their little hell and be given the chance to be the animal who they always had the potential to be, but um, they would have never been able to grow into, you know, had they stayed in PetSmart's grips. Well, these are, are real beings too. This isn't like a Disney cartoon or some kind of, you know, right. some kind of fantasy. These are, these are real beings. And the fact that in light of the investigation, you still had people wondering what the big deal was. Yeah. Well, it's that these are, these little deals are big deals. These little animals are much bigger deals than we, we say, or we think. Absolutely. You know, and, and they count the same. I mean, they, they count the same in the law's eyes. And um, they ought to count the same in our eyes. It, it really doesn't matter, you know, if they have scales, if they have feathers, if they have fur, um, if they have two wings or it's four feet. I mean, they all have the nervous system. They all feel pain. They all suffer. They all feel terror and fear um, and unhappiness. And similarly, they feel joy and they feel excitement. And, um, you know, uh, you don't need you don't need to to look any further than seeing a guinea pig you know leap into the air off of all four of his feet when he's playing, or to see you know this little hamster um, enjoying you know a, a snack of of some greens or you know some seeds. That in and of itself, I think, um, really demonstrates how how complex they are um, and how you know, just like the species we're more familiar with, um, how they deserve our respect and um, how under the law, you know, they deserve to be protected from, from unnecessary pain and suffering. Well, Dan Payton with PETA Investigations, thank you for, for joining us. We'll follow the case. And in the meantime, people should just, they could write PetSmart, I guess, but it probably would be more effective if they just don't shop there. Yep, we hit, we do we have an action alert set up at PETA.org so people can click very easily and send an email to their to their leadership, directly to their email addresses, telling them exactly what they think. Um, they can go into PetSmart and tell them why they're not shopping there. Social media certainly gets companies' attention these days, so go on to Facebook and go on to Twitter um, and spread the word. You know, th there are a lot of good people who care about animals who still go to PetSmart and they do it unknowingly. They have no idea that they're really subsidizing awful, um, arguably criminal conduct. Um, so show that video, you know, it, it help raise awareness among good people that um, you really should not be caught dead inside these stores until they stop selling all animals, period. Dan Payton with the PETA Investigations. Thanks for being on the PETA Podcast. My pleasure. Thank you. That's Dan Payton, Director of Evidence Analysis for PETA Investigations. On the undercover investigations at three PetSmart locations around the country that had budgetary policies not to feed or care for small animals, resulting, of course, in abuse and neglect. For more information, you can see the video and take action at PETA.org. You can contact us at PETA.org. And once again, thank you for listening. Don't forget to go to iTunes and rate and review the show. It'll help us reach more people and let them know why it's important to speak out and take action for the animals. Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. And join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on the PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo.